Hi guys, it's Professor Costa, and today we're going to be talking about concepts of critical care nursing and um, patients with acute coronary syndrome. So the history of coronary care units. So before we got all specialized, um, most nurses were kind of general care. And in the 1950s and 60s, we developed, um, we realized that cardiovascular disease was the most common diagnosis. In the 1960s, 30 to 40% mortality rate for myocardial infarction. Can you imagine? Before we developed clot busters and cardiac caths, 30 to 40% of uh, clients presenting with an MI would die. In 1965, the first specialized ICU, the coronary care unit, was developed, and that was done in Kansas City, Kansas, by Dr. Hugh Day, and he coined the term. And then um, following that, that's when the emergence of other specialty ICUs followed, right? So um, one, the, the deaths, um, one, it come from malignant arrhythmias, right, in the post-infarction setting. And so they developed not only the, the ability to monitor these patients, but they also developed techniques for external defibrillation. Right, And that way, if a patient goes into a lethal um, V-fib or VTAC arrest, we're now able to defibrillate them and hopefully restart and bring them back. So it has done a lot to um, get rid of the risk of sudden cardiac death from these arrhythmias. Right. So principles of critical care, definitely continuous monitoring and treatment, high intensity therapies and interventions, expert surveillance and efficiency. You, um, if you are lucky enough to get um, selected to work in a critical care unit right out of school, make sure that your um, program, your, um, your new grad program includes lots of additional classes. You have to be an expert. You can't just you know, look at vital signs and medications. You really have to be able to assess your patients well. All right. You have to alert to early manifestation of other organ failure. The, you know, the body um, is a system. And if we have failure of the kidneys, um, that will cause um, increased fluid retention and, and that could lead to heart failure. So one thing can lead to another. And we have to monitor all organ function while we're in the critical care environment. Right. And we have to do rec uh, recognize parameters denoting progress or deterioration. We're looking for goals or we're looking to assess um, thing changes very quickly and reporting those as they, um, you know, as they occur. So we have to be very, very good at our assessment. So goals of critical care. Well, we want to keep the patient alive, basically. So it's towards the survival of the critical kill ill patient and restoring quality of life. Right. We want to restore optimal physiologic, psychologic, social and spiritual potential. And we also want to help the family members and loved ones of these critically ill patients in coping with crises. It is a long, complicated route to have a client um, or fa and family member in a critical care environment. So the roles of the critical care nurse. So we're their care provider. We're going to help the client obtain necessary care and support their basic needs. Comprehensive direct care to the patient and family. Um, you're not going to find a lot of CNAs or UAPs in a critical care unit. Most of the care is provided by the nurse, the washing, the oral care, not all in every unit but the majority. And the reason why is that even rolling a patient to their side someone who has an advanced airway or invasive cardiac monitoring or um, a balloon pump or you name it, all of these things have inherent risks associated. It isn't just rolling a patient with basic care. It's being able to assess the changes in your patient while you provide that care. We're also an educator, right? Based on their, your patient's needs and severity of the situation, we have to be able to assess, is the client even capable of taking the information in right now? Manager, right? So the nurse basically runs the show. The, yes, the physician writes orders, but it's the nurse who coordinates all the other specialties and makes sure that the patient is being seen by the right people. And we advocate for their rights. Absolutely, the nurse is the, probably the number one advocate besides the family for the patient and their rights.
So patient assessment, we have to know everything. I, I joke with my students, you know, like we want to know pertinent medical information. I don't care if, you know, they scraped their knee when they were five. Well, I'm going to backtrack on that a little bit. If you have a patient in a critical care unit, you kind of do need to know everything that you could possibly know about the client, right? Their whole medical history, their social history, their medical interventions. Um, we want to make sure that we're assessing their airway patency, pallor, sweating, mental state, posture, facial expressions, general condition. We're going to look in every nook and cranny. In many cases, we have clients that aren't able to speak up for themselves, especially if they have um, an advanced airway. They can't tell us if there's pain developing in one of their toes. They can't tell us if their lower back hurts or they have flank pain. So we have to be the detectives and we have to make sure we're doing a really thorough and um, visual, uh, visual assessment. Um, and then we have to find. So we're going to do respiratory care. We're going to uh, watch for adequacy of oxygenation, um, ABCs, watching urine output, conscious, um, conscious uh, levels, monitor for changes in any of the above, right? We are the watchdogs. We watch every single minute change in a client in a uh, critical care environment. These aren't walkie-talkie patients that get up and bring themselves to their bathroom. They're, they're completely dependent on the nursing care that they re uh, receive to keep them from harm. So patient monitoring. So information from the monitoring equipment. Yes, there is a lot of info coming at a critical care nurse. Uh, overload in some cases, a lot of alarms. There is something called alarm fatigue where people just consistently ignore alarms or they silence them without really looking at why the alarm is going off because the alarms constantly go off. The information from the monitoring equipment is just that, it's information. It does not replace an assessment, all right? Sometimes machines break down or they give us bad data and they're only as good within their natural parameters. For instance, people are so reliant on SpO2 readings, pulse ox. Remember from our oxygenation lecture that if a patient is really anemic, they're going to have a really high pulse ox, even though they may not have an overall good amount of oxygen. They may be hypoxic. And the reason is that it's just based on the limitations of the machine. All right. Always compare your assessment to the number. I had a patient that looked fabulous by the numbers and coded. So always compare with manual recording. So if you're getting weird blood pressures, always take a manual pressure at least once a shift. If you're, um, you know, titrating vasopressors, you absolutely need to make sure that your automated recordings correlate with a manual recording. All right. And you want to assess, record and analyze findings frequent, frequently and continuously. That's why it's an intensive care unit. You may be making changes to drips every five minutes. You may be calling a provider and changing the plan multiple times in a shift. So we're going to be doing this frequently and continuously. So immediate care. So we may administer oxygen via face mask or we may be advocating for our patients to be intubated. We're going to maintain client safety, maintain fluid replacement, monitor cardiac instability, monitor urine out. Uh, urine output hourly. So hourly urine output. Why? Because the kidneys are the martyrs of the body. And if there's something going on system-wide, the first place you're going to notice it is in the kidneys. Arterial blood gas analysis. And we're going to maintain critical care status. So here's a review of myocardial infarction. So if you had time and you watched my other video, which is located Oh, I forget which folder. It's probably under advanced central perfusion. 80 to 90% of all acute MIs are secondary to thrombus formation, right? So if we have a uh, plaque buildup, um, a narrowing of those coronary arteries, and then we're just inviting a platelet party, right? So, or it could be plaque rupture, but 80 to 90% are thrombus. When the thrombus develops, perfusion to the myocardium distal to the occlusion is halted, resulting in necrosis. That means that the artery is blocked and the section of heart it feeds is dying. That's what this means. The acute MI process takes time. So cardiac cells can withstand ischemic conditions for about 20 minutes prior to cellular death. 
So if they have chest pain, we need to address it now. If the ischemia persists, it takes approximately four to six hours for the entire thickness to become necrosed. Okay, so development of myocardial necrosis secondary to a critical imbalance between O2 supply and myocardial demand, meaning that heart tissue is going to die if we don't get the area reperfused. So STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction, right? So ideally, right, door to um, balloon is about 90 minutes of hospital arrival. So we want a primary percutaneous intervention within 90 minutes of hospital arrival. So we wanna get them to the cath lab. Initial treatment, all right? So people always ask me, oh, Professor Costa, what's the priority and what should we do? Okay. The first thing you do for uh, treatment of an MI is not to go for the morphine, right? Morphine is great for pain relief and anxiety, and it may um, decrease the demand the heart has for oxygen, but that's not what's gonna fix this problem, right? Aspirin is gonna you know, prevent this problem from getting worse. So an, a priority intervention would be aspirin, and I don't have it on this slide, but oh, it's down uh, further. But um, we want to make sure that this problem doesn't get worse and that maybe we can open up another lane of traffic here. We might be able to squeeze in some perfusion. So aspirin and nitroglycerin are our priority interventions. All right. If um, their pulse ox is below 94 percent, according to American Heart Association, that's when we would add oxygen. I'll be honest with you, I've never gotten in trouble putting oxygen on a patient having an MI, but according to American Heart, we would initiate oxygen if their pulse ox is less than 94%, all right? So aspirin is a priority. Nitroglycerin is a priority. Yes, we wanna give morphine, but that's not the first thing I'm running for. I wanna fix the problem or prevent it from getting worse, all right? Um, IV fluids to maintain blood vol volume and perfusion, right? So if the heart is impacted, with, uh, part of it's dying, it may not be doing an excellent job of pumping. And we may have signs of cardiogenic shock or um, at least decreased cardiac output. So we may need some IV fluids to maintain blood volume and perfusion. We want, okay, we have part of the heart that is not receiving oxygen and is dying. We may again end up with an arrhythmia. So antiarrhythmics or beta blockers absolutely are gonna be on board because we don't want to go into a lethal arrhythmia like V-fib or VTAC. We wanna treat the pump failure, right? We wanna increase cardiac output, all right? And we wanna uh, reduce blood pressure because we want the, the heart to be able to contract and pump and we want our systemic vascular resistance to not be as high. We want a good blood pressure, but we don't want a failing heart to have to work against a really high systemic vascular resistance. So we want to reduce the workload of the heart. And to do that, we reduce preload. And we do that with furosemide. And we, we get a twofer for that. Not only do we reduce preload, but we also help um, reduce pulmonary edema vasodilators, right? We don't want the heart to have to work against a high systemic vascular resistance. And we also want to open up those, um, you know, coronary arteries the most we can, right? So a vasodilator like nitroprusside, which would reduce venous return and cardiac workload, and or an inotrope, right? We want to in increase the pump. So dopamine, dobutamine, um, those are nice inotropes. All right, so this is not a new slide. Um, this is the acute coronary syndrome algorithm. Um, this is also found in your ACLS book. No, I'm not gonna fight with the American Heart Association. So if we have a client who has symptoms suggestive of ischemia or infarction, what are those symptoms? Those are different in every single person. You may have someone with the typical crushing chest pain, elephant sitting on my chest accompanied by diaphoresis um, and pallor, and it might be that classic symptom that you see on TVs all the uh, time. They may have pain radiating down their left arm. You can also have patients, especially females, women don't always present with chest pain. Mo most times they have maybe some chest discomfort or they may have GI symptoms. I've had clients come in complaining of jaw pain. 
All right, so not everyone presents the same, but symptoms suggestive of ischemia or infarction. So EMS assessment and care of the hospital uh, and hospital prep, right? So we want to monitor their ABCs. Remember, part of the heart is impaired, so we could go into a lethal arrhythmia. We have to be prepared to provide CPR and defibrillate. We want to administer um, aspirin, right? We want, to we want to keep this problem from getting any worse. So have them chew 325 of aspirin. We may hold aspirin if, you know, they have an active GI bleed and they're vomiting blood, that kind of thing. But, um, or they have act being actively treated for ulcers and so forth. But for most patients, 325 of aspirin isn't going to hurt them, okay? And we're going to consider oxygen. Uh, uh, American Heart Association says to treat them if their O2 sat is less than 94%, okay? Um, nitroglycerin, right? So nitro... Um, vasodilates and will maybe hopefully uh, open up that coronary artery enough to allow for some blood flow at, at any point it wouldn't hurt it'll help hopefully open up a lane of traffic remember though that nitroglycerin is a vasodilator so we may have a drop in blood pressure and you, you're really going to have to um, assess blood pressure when you use nitro morphine if needed so if they're complaining of chest pain when you have pain it increases your uh, sympathetic nervous response and you're, it's going to make things worse. That's why morphine is a nice drug and it helps with the pain. But it isn't, it isn't going to fix the problem. Aspirin and nitro may fix the problem, okay? So we want to attain a 12-lead EKG. If we have ST elevation, we need to make sure we're getting them to the hospital as fast as possible. And we're going to note the time of onset and the first medical contact, right? We need to get to a cath lab, right? Or if they don't have a cath lab, at least have the ability to give um, fibrinolysis, all right? So um, some clot busting medication, all right? So we want to notify the hospital and that they know that they have a STEMI coming in, okay? And if considering pre-hospital fibrinolysis, use a fibrinolytic checklist. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, living in Rhode Island as we do, why would we consider giving the patient a medication that's really risky prior to transport? We live in Rhode Island where the, you can throw a, uh, a stone and hit a hospital or a medical care facility. There are parts of this country where you could have a heart attack and it's hours away from the nearest healthcare facility. And that time is going to, you know, impact outcome. So there are um, paramedics, there are uh, first responders that are authorized to, um, based on their findings and a checklist, they're allowed to give a fibrinolytic uh, medication to a client in the field, all right? So we're gonna go down to the next box. So concurrent ED assessment, meaning we're doing these things simultaneously and we're doing it quickly. We're going to check vital signs, give an IV, a, a brief targeted history and a physical exam. We're going to review and complete the fibrinolytic checklist, make sure that there's no contraindications like active bleeding. We want um, to draw, you know, serum troponin levels and get coags drawn and obtain a portable chest x-ray. Remember that one of the great mimickers of an MI is aortic dissection and we want a chest x-ray or make sure it isn't like something else that mimics like a pneumothorax or something. Immediate ED general treatment. So if they are, if their O2 sats are low, we're gonna give them an oxygen. We're gonna give them the aspirin, nitro, and morphine, okay? We're gonna do ECG interpretation. So we're gonna do a 12 lead EKG. And if they have a STEMI, which is the ST elevation MI, or indications of a brand new left bundle branch block, if we can, we're gonna get them right to reperfusion. That's the goal, is to open that vessel up, either by clot buster or by balloon, right? Uh, we're gonna bring it to the cath lab. So I'm um, gonna continue that down. So time from onset of symptoms is less than 12 hours, then we're gonna bring you to the cath lab. Okay, so door to balloon inflation, PCI, percutaneous um, balloon, is less than 90 minutes from arrival at the emergency room. And door to needle, fibrinolysis, is a goal of 30 minutes. Okay. Let's say, let's go to box nine, and we'll say that they have an ST depression or dynamic T-wave inversion. Remember, if that T-wave is upside down, 
and a lead two. Um, it's strongly suspicious for ischemia. And if they have a high risk, um, if they're high risk for not and a non STEMI. So let's just say we have chest pain, we have some flip T waves, the patient's a smoker and a diabetic and has high lipids, then um, we're going to go to box 10. All right. So is the troponin elevated or if they're a really high risk patient, we may do early invasive strategies, right? So we may do things that we would do for a STEMI with a non-STEMI if it's really highly probable that we're just not seeing it and they do have a blockage, right? So if they're having refractory ischemic chest discomfort, like really bad chest pain, it doesn't go away. If they're having runs of VTAC or signs of heart failure, um, we may end up um, doing other things. They may end up going to the cath lab after all. Or we may start adju uh, adjunctive therapies like nitroglycerin or heparin. All right, so that patient still isn't out of the woods. And once in a while, if the probability is high enough, they may still bring them um, for further, you know, uh, interventions, right? Let's go to box 11. So if we have chest pain and a normal or non-diagnostic non -diagnostic changes in an ST segment or T wave, and they have a low intermediate or lower intermediate risk of acute coronary syndrome, then we're going to watch them. So if you have your 16 year old that complained to chest pain, but just ate, you know, 12 hot dogs, um, we're not going to send you to the cath lab for that. We're going to watch you because you're complaining of chest pain. We're going to give you your, you know, uh, gas X or whatever else you need for your GI symptoms. Um, we're still going to work you up. We're going to make sure you're safe. Um, but if you have a low risk for acute coronary syndrome, you're not going to be rushed to the cath lab. So, STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction. So, we want to evaluate fluid volume status, and we're going to do that with a pulmonary artery catheter. Um, we may need to use an intraaortic balloon pump, and we introduce that um, content with the cardiogenic shock. So if we have a failing pump, we may need to augment that pump with a balloon. All right. If we have uh, some arrhythmias or an, you know, some angry uh, cells that are causing problems with our um, electrical conduction, they may need a temporary pacing wire. All right. They may need mechanical ventilation or CPAP to maintain adequate oxygenation. They may need um, an arterial line so that we can um, actively manage blood pressure changes. And most of these patients end up with a Foley catheter. And not only so that, you know, we don't have to clean them up all the time. Actually, it's so that we can monitor hourly urine output. Remember, the kidneys are the martyrs of the body. So if we have good urine output, chances are we're doing our job very, very well. So long-term treatment of an STEMI. We want to prevent remodeling and subsequent CHF. We want to make sure that we can uh, salvage as much of this tissue as possible, and we want to prevent scar tissue formation. So these patients are going to be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, and those have been proven to afford long-term survival benefit, okay? And then we want to prevent future MIs. So a platelet inhibitor like aspirin or Plavix or Brylinta, and they're going to be on that for a long term. So a problem, uh, problem with this is nutrition. So we want to address it early. If we have a patient in a critical care environment, especially with an advanced airway, we want to correct or prevent nutritional deficiencies. So um, ideally, if the patient has a functioning gut, so we want to do enteral feedings. That might be through an NG tube or an orogastric tube or a PEG. Um, if we can't use enteral feedings for whatever reason, then we will go with parenteral. So that would be like central line feedings or even um, you know, TPN or PPN, depending on what kind of IV they have. Anxiety. So 70 to 80% of patients with, um, with a STEMI report severe anxiety. Indicators would be agitation, an increase in blood pressure, increased heart rate, verbalization, and restlessness. We want to be a good advocate and teach our patients a lot of fear and anxiety comes from the fact that they don't understand what's going on. All right. 
So the treatments we implement may also increase their anxiety. So you have to tell your patient and their family what you're doing when you do it. Pain. So 70% of patients reported moderate to severe pain with an MI. And they, they've, it's been called the fifth vital sign. And again, pain increases that sympathetic nervous system response, adds to anxiety and agitation. If we're nervous, it's going to increase our myocardial oxygenation consumption, and it also delays wound healing, that stress response. So we want to treat pain. Communication. So our critically ill patient isn't going to be able to tell us what's going on. So, um, and oftentimes these patients are either paralyzed or sedated or simply sedated. We need to be able to increase communication abilities of our patient. So they'll have the sedation vacations where we let you wake up a little bit and we can assess for things like ICU um, delirium and um, maybe have you point at a picture board or squeeze your hand. We wanna make sure you're able to follow commands. Um, patients can hear your voice, by the way, and still respond. Even if they're moderately sedated, you can still you know, ask a client to squeeze your hand. And in many cases, they're still able to comply and do that. So sensory perceptual problems. So ICU psychosis delirium is a big problem. So 15 to 40% of all ICU patients end up with some form of ICU psychosis. And it's an alteration in mentation. And how do we assess for it, especially if we have a patient with an advanced airway? Um, they have uh, a confusion assessment methods, um, the CAM, and they have a, a modified one called the CAM ICU. And that's um, ways that we can um, determine if the patient is able to follow commands correctly and isn't developing this psychosis, right? So alteration in mentation, psychomotor behavior, alterations in sleep, right? So um, there was a study where it showed that patients in the ICU, um, the amount of times per hour, 24 seven, that they're actually woken up or, or disturbed, it's multiple times, like six to eight times every hour. You do that for more than a few days, you'd be feeling a little um, delirious yourself. Um, we need a full REM sleep cycle in order to maintain normal um, cognition. And we're not allowing that in our ICU. So we do need to cluster care when we can and allow for patients, if, if possible, if they're not that critically ill, allow them to get those 90 minutes to two hours of sleep, right? So if we don't have to be in there banging around, um, or if we are, um, making sure that during the night, if we don't have to turn the lights on, we don't turn the lights on. Um, or we pull, provide a sleep mask for a patient. Or, um, you know, making sure every client is in a room with a window. Those circadian rhythms with um, light and dark really do affect sleep. And sleep has been shown to be one of the, the leading things that leads to this delirium. All right. Okay. Um, Back to the sleep deprivation, poor weeks, uh, sleep, wake cycles, lack of REM sleep, right. So um, things that could disturb your patient's sleep cycle, um, we know we want hourly intake and output. We know that we're oftentimes um, doing interventions even every 15 minutes, but whenever possible, we wanna do those things without disturbing the patient. I always uh, joke with my patients that, you know, I'm a big, um, if you've never met me, I'm very tall, a big person. And I always joke that I'm not the most delicate flower, but you may catch me sneaking in your room in the middle of the night. Because if you're asleep, I'm not going to wake you up. I have a pen light and I am not afraid to use it. Um, so we want to make sure that we do not um, interrupt the sleep as much as possible. All right. So subsequent management, treatment of complications. So... I could go on and on about this all day, but I'm not. Um, we want to make sure that we're monitoring them for arrhythmias. And if they occur, we want to nip those in the bud, either electrically or with medication. We want to watch for pump failure, right? We're assessing those lung sounds. We're watching for signs of CHF. We want to prevent thromboembolism. How many clients in this uh you know, in an ICU situation that are sedated, end up with a PE. It's just amazing. So we're going to actively prevent those. We're going to put on their SCDs or TEDs. They may get 
heparin infusions or subcutaneous heparin or Lovenox to prevent DVTPE. And we wanna make sure that we're managing any acidosis that occurs um, either with medications like bicarb or through their vent settings, okay? And we wanna prevent the cause of those. And secondary prevention of further consequences. These patients are managed for everything. The stress response elicits a glucose dumping. So these patients often end up um, hyperglycemic, even if they have no history of diabetes. So most of these patients are on a strict sliding scale and we're managing the, their sugars very carefully. Um, we wanna make sure that their skin doesn't break down. We wanna make sure that um, their mouth care is taken care of. Um, their bowel regimen, at, we are handling every single body function for them. So here's a picture of a postcode patient in the CCU. So this patient has a trach. This patient has um, all the orange tape on the side suggests that they have a chest tube. Um, they're on EKG monitoring. They have, it's amazing what we have to do to support the human while they're healing from this code. And this person doesn't even look that old. He looks probably maybe 40 years old. Um, it's a huge undertaking and it's the nurse's responsibility to make sure that all of these tubes stay patent, all the machine is, machines are doing what they're supposed to, when they're supposed to, um, and that we're uh, monitoring the entire patient status. Um, yes, physicians do come in and they do their assessment and they write orders, but they're in the room for a very small amount of time and the rest of it is under the nurse's responsibility. So patient safety. Everyone is human and errors do happen because it's a hectic and complex environment, right? Um, we may do things that we shouldn't have done without realizing, right? Um, multiple technologic and pharmacologic interventions. I've worked in units where you have 10 different drips going and each one of them has to be titrated by the nurse. And we work at a really, really fast pace and you may select something for a titration thinking it's in the best interest of your patient and, and how you're, you're following your training, and it's not. So um, mistakes happen, that's how we learn, but hopefully you're taking your time. Um, we need you to, to do these things efficiently, but we don't want you to work in a panic. So the urgency of slowing down, that's the point I was trying to make. So yes, we wanna do things purposefully, and not, you know, hectically. We want to make sure we're using that good closed loop communication um, so that everyone's on the same page. I've received a message, I acknowledge the message, I complete the task, and then I inform the person that delegated the task to me that the task is complete. And then being present, right? So sometimes um, patients you know, uh, surprise you with the things that they remember following their uh, stay in the ICU. And they come back months later and they tell you, you know, um, I didn't know who you were, but I always felt better when I heard your voice or um, I heard you when you told me that things were gonna be okay, even though I couldn't open my eyes and tell you that. Um, patients remember these things just because they're sedated and ventilated. Don't think that there's a person there and um, trying to be present and don't get so caught up in all the mechanical and drips and all the stuff around you that you're, you forget that you're caring for a human being.